All right. Well, welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, welcome to the Future of Work managing remote teams and projects webinar hosted by West Michigan Tech Talent. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Your microphones have been muted and your cameras are turned off so you don't have to worry about figuring out where your mute button is. Um, however, if you do have questions for the panelists throughout the duration of the presentation, um, there is a questions box you'll see on the toolbar on the right where you can put any questions that you have over there in that section. So my name is Ann Pentiak. I'm the industry council lead for West Michigan Tech Talent. For those of you who aren't familiar with WMTT, we are a council based in West Michigan that is comprised of employers, education partners, economic development, and workforce development experts. West Michigan Tech Talent looks to engage employers of information technology professionals with best practices, resources, and a community to grow, develop, recruit and retain a world-class, diverse, inclusive IT workforce here in West Michigan. West Michigan Works serves as the backbone agency for the council, and we are all thrilled to host this panel of experts for you today. The agenda tonight is as followed. Um, I will do introductions for our guest panelists. We will do the panel discussion, and then afterwards, um, we will do a Q&A to answer any questions that may not have been addressed by the panelists. So who do we have with us tonight? Uh, moderating our panel is Rob Gear, who is an account executive for Ronstad Technologies. As an account executive, Rob helps clients find solutions for their, te for their technology projects and talent needs. From Spectrum Health, we have Jane Geetzen, Director of Information Services. Jane is known for her community service as well as her technical and leadership skills. Joining us as well is Bill DeWitt, the Director of North American Infrastructure for Gordon Food Service. Bill's currently working on infrastructure initiatives such as the adoption of the Google Cloud Platform and adoption of SAFE for planning and priority management. Also joining us tonight, we have Sarah Schmidt, the current CISO for Farmers Insurance. She'll be joining the discussion tonight as well and bringing her um, 15 years of experience in information security. Through that, she has established her reputation as an inclusive and proactive leader. And last but certainly not least, we have Joel Ross from Augusto Digital rounding out our panel. Joel is, Joel is the CFO and Director of Technology and has been hiring and managing remote teams for the past five years. Before we get things kicked off, um, before we get things kicked off, please be sure to add any of the questions you have for the panelists in the Q&A section of the toolbar. We will have ample time at the end to answer any questions that you may have. I also want to thank you all for joining us and thank our panelists for bringing their expertise to the table tonight. And I hope the insight that you gained tonight as attendees will leave you with tangible strategies for managing your own remote workers and projects. With that, I will turn the mic over to Rob to get us started with our panel discussion. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Anne, I appreciate it. Well, we're gonna be talking a little bit today about all the fun we've had over the past year with uh, the remote workforce. Um, Everybody's uh, made a, uh, a big migration over from seeing everybody face to face every day to working remote. And we've learned a lot of lessons over that time. So we're gonna go through and uh, talk a little bit about some of the um, lessons learned and some of the areas that we could uh, learn from our experts here. So I guess to start with, let's ask, um, actually, okay, yeah, we're good. So we're gonna ask everybody, what uh, what are some successful efforts your organization has had in keeping your remote workers engaged and motivated? Who wants to start? Bill, you wanna take that one for us? No volume, Bill. Yeah, there we go. That might there, work Bill. better. See, this is one of the fun things about working remote is there is never a meeting that goes by where somebody doesn't have trouble with either so first their lesson, camera. lesson learned is checking your mic. <laughs> well, okay, I, I, I guess that's the first lesson learned I haven't learned yet. So <laughs> okay, second lesson learned. 
anyway, we, we've had uh, a, a good uh, experience with going remote because we had been all in on the Google tool set before it. So thankfully, we didn't have this crazy transition to learning technology. So we had everybody trained up. That helped right out of the chute. But right away, we made sure we stepped up our town hall events. So this would be a way for our CIO to really give status on a lot of this and then to take a lot of Q&A from folks. So that was a big key element here right out of the chute. Another one is we really encouraged a lot of digital stand-ups. These were stand-ups that often happened at a conference room. And we really said, hey, folks, you got to do stand-ups. You probably have to do stand-ups a little more often than you did before because you aren't seeing people in the hallways or, or in the coffee areas. And, and maybe branch your teams out a little bit to some of those folks that you do interact with a lot, but again, you're not seeing live anymore. And so our digital stand-ups actually have, have gone beyond just the core team and they've added key other people. And then one, frankly, just uh, yesterday, just tried it out for the first time, we did a topical coffee break. So we said, hey, everybody interested in Disney World, because everybody's going to Disney World here, it seems coming up. And we have a couple of folks who are absolutely Disney fanatics. So a couple of folks who moderated a, a coffee break room and everybody could ask questions, give their tips and hints and techniques about how to handle Disney World here over the next month or even into the summer. And we had 45 people show up for that coffee break room yesterday. And we're looking at maybe doing gardening here shortly or a foodies one or a wine person one, which I would personally moderate, uh, things like that. So uh, those have been things that we've been using, Rob, to really uh, create a better remote experience. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Anybody else have anything they want to add to that? All right. Um, what's some positive feedback we've received from your teams? So, Bill, you had some pretty good ideas there. Uh, what kind of feedback you got from the employees on that? Uh, I mean, you know, Disney and foodies. I, I want to join the foodies group right now, especially with Gordon Foods menu. <laughs> well, some some positive feedback about the remote work experience for us. One has been we we had some remote employees prior to the pandemic. We are a North American company. We've got people spread in Canada and Texas, Florida, et cetera. Remote, frankly, has leveled the playing field where now that everybody's remote, uh, nobody feels kind of left out of that team meeting experience where, you know, seven people are in a conference room and two people are remote. Now, our struggle is going to be once we start going back into the office, what are we going to do? Are we going to force everybody to stay virtual in their team meetings or go back to the have and have nots? And we're frankly still wrestling with that a little bit. But um, a lot of positive feedback from those who are already remote. Second of all, just a good feedback about fewer distractions, more productivity. Everybody's even admitting because they're not commuting, they're probably working a little bit longer hours than they were before. Uh, and it's not so bad. It's not stressful, especially during the winter months, as we all know, being West Michigan based, to not have that West Michigan winter commute has been a big morale booster. Uh, and, and those who are skeptical at the beginning are, are pretty darn positive about remote work right now and provide a lot of feedback to me about that. Awesome, thanks, Bill. Sarah, what do you have going on at Farmers? A lot of the same things as Bill. We really invested recently, like luckily, about two years ago in collaboration tools. And that's the video, it's the chat systems, it's all of those things, which were being used a little bit before COVID, um, we are farmers that spread across the country like, like Bill's team, but everyone jumped in head first when, when we all sent home. So all the calls, everybody's on video, the chats, we, you know, we don't have the topical meetings like Bill does, although that's a brilliant idea and we want to start it, but we have our own chats now. So, you know, in my team, we had a big Marvel conversation when everybody's watching WandaVision and all the different things that are coming out in the Marvel world. And so we just side chats and threads going on and on about What's, and so finding those little things, I think, to connect uh, folks across different, you know, different locations and, you know, working from home has been really important for us. We've tried to do a couple um, 
like virtual getaways, right? So we did a virtual like scavenger hunt and we did a virtual family feud type of thing. And I think that's for us is going to be key. And I and similar to Bill, I think what, what problem we're trying to solve is how do you maintain culture and how do you maintain engagement in a virtual environment long term? Right. So I think we we farmers think this is going to be a new normal for us. We will have people spread out across across the country. And so how do we how do we solve for that? How do we continue to to kind of maintain culture with folks that maybe you have never met and might and might never meet? So those are those are where we're being very forward facing about it. So it's pretty exciting. Thanks, Sarah. What what strategies do you uh, have in place to uh, or have you developed to keep projects moving forward through this? Jane? And Jane, you're on mute. I actually have a T-shirt that says "You're on mute." I should get I it printed. We play the um, the Zoom bingo game. You know, I, am I? Can you hear me? Are you on mute? Can you see my presentation? <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, life and pandemic. So I I would say maybe I'm unique in this panel that not only did we have to go remote workforce, but we had to support um, our uh, patients and our clinicians and to go virtual in from a visit perspective. We, had, we accelerated basically our virtual health strategy that we had planned over three years in like three months. And, um, the other the other challenges that we've had is like scheduling and and executing on testing and scheduling and executing on uh, vaccine and so our team has been super busy during this remote work from home era. Um, the other thing that we did in the in the midst of all of this is we launched Safe our first PI for, for the first clinical train that we launched was uh, March 20th. We went home March 13th. So a little panic that we could figure out how to do Pi Days virtually, but we, we did it and with great success actually. And I, you know, I'm a little squeamish now of being in a room with that many people. So I don't mind the virtual Pi Days. And you know we've we've used tools like Miro and Jira and Teams. Thank goodness we had gone live with Teams like a year before, so we had people that were very accustomed to Teams. And I would say Microsoft hats off to Microsoft. They've been adding features all along, so uh, keeps people entertained as we're moving forward. So probably um, you know this safe line has been actually very timely and helpful in keeping people connected because of because of the ceremony process so that that has been very key to our strategy i'd like to echo that real quick uh we also brought in safe now we did it about a year before the pandemic but to just to echo jane's comments we've been able to pull that off in a virtual way that has been a lifesaver for us and, yes. and continuing to figure out what work to work on what is the true highest priorities of the company in a time where we're trying to save money but you know the world has not stopped even for food service where a lot of the world has stopped uh mm -hmm. but a tremendous amount of work and safe has been critical to us as well awesome thanks bill and jane Joe, we had talked a little bit before this. Uh, you had mentioned your teams have been remote since the company started over at Augusto. Um, what are your future plans now that you've uh, that you get to implement and keep up with productivity and management? Yeah, I think the first we're going to get everybody a giant unmute button so they can just hit that when they need to. Uh, beyond that, like we, we've talked about space um, bar, space bar yeah, works. That's right. Um, gi giving everybody who's coming on board an onboarding buddy, so someone who's been in the company for a while who it's not necessarily on their team or their project, but they can go to that person and just ask those questions. Um, I think that's that's really 
would be a nice thing to be able to provide people so you get those those answers. Um, Bill, we mentioned some knowledge sharing and we'd like to do some lunch and learns that are across teams and like sending people to to training where you with people that you're not working with every day and just you build some of that camaraderie and get to know people. Um, same thing with with like a, a annual company meeting where we all come together in person when when we can finally get back to doing that. And then the last thing is is I think we really need to get to a point where we're like a written culture. Where we write everything down. Um, that's kind of how you avoid some of the Zoom fatigue is make everything asynchronous. Um, you don't get on as many meetings. You write everything down. You've got it for new people who are coming on board or your historical sense. And, and I think that's, to me, that'd be a big thing that I think we'd be working for. Thanks, Joel. Have you seen any uh, difference in the performance of your remote staff compared to what they were doing when they were on site in previous years? Sarah? Funny you asked that, Rob. So about two years ago, farmers did an assessment of like, we had a few remote staff, um, some in IT, some not, and they were working out of their homes at the time, but most of the, the population was in an office. And we we looked like, okay, let's measure, you know, we do these annual, you know, reportings and, and these annual ratings for, for everybody, like how is our remote staff compared to our in in-house staff from a rating standpoint, and it was spot on, it was it was aligned, right? There was no real difference. And so then, you know, obviously we sent everybody home just like everybody did. Um, and while we had some adjustments in expectations that had to be made, because there's a difference between planning to be a home worker or suddenly being a home worker and a home schooler and a home everything, um, we had to level set what expectations look like in the beginning. And we've definitely gotten to a point where we're certainly at the same operating speed as we were before. Uh, but we have seen no, nothing nothing to the detriment of, of working from home and are definitely looking and, and planning to allow folks to continue to stay home indefinitely if that's, if that's what they desire. Thanks, Sarah. Joel, how about you from your, your team? We've been fully remote, so we haven't really noticed any difference in performance. But I think, uh, um, you know, some of those same type of things is, is measuring how productive people are on projects. Awesome. Have you guys done anything to uh, address the impact of uh, COVID outside of the workplace? And Jane, you had mentioned you had quite a few uh, things going on in Spectrum. Yeah. It, it... Uh, very fortunate to work for an organization like Spectrum where we're, uh, we were able to offer all of our employees a lot of benefit. I would encourage anybody who's listening that has an EAP program to take the time to remind your employees about that benefit and what it offers because I think people forget that they have that. That's kind of um, a benefit you only tap into when you need to. So we brought our EAP folks in just to just to give that re that friendly reminder about what is possible. The other thing that the organization did in a, in whole is um, got people um, care.com membership. So anybody that works at Spectrum Health can access care.com for free. And we also offer, offered some subsidies for people for childcare because there's so many people that are trying to balance work and homeschooling and all the other things that that come along with not just our employees being in pandemic mode, but their entire families being in pandemic mode. So uh, I feel really uh, blessed to have uh, to work for an organization that has really recognized um, some of the difficulties here. And uh, you know, the other the other thing that that I've been doing with my leaders and the people that report to me directly. Um, is really reminding people to check in, check in with your folks. And, you know, we have a lot of introverts that, you know, it's hard, it's like pulling teeth to get them to talk about what's happening in their lives. But just if, if they know you're there, and what, what I've also found is that being authentic myself and sharing some of my own struggles gives them permission to share theirs. And, um, 
so I think that's a that's a very powerful thing that you can do as a leader to you know to to open up the conversation. I think the other thing that we have to be really wary and cautious about is is reentry and what that's going to look like. Um, this whole concept of back to normal is not going to be a thing. And so we need to figure out what the new normal is and give people a ton of grace to to make that adjustment because it's it's going to be huge. You know, adjusting to pandemic is one thing, but adjusting out of pandemic is another that can't be uh, underestimated. Great points. All right, we've talked quite a bit about um, what it's like to motivate your existing teams and dealing with challenges they have. How about recruiting remote talent? You know, that's a that's a whole new norm for people. You know, they've had people uh, come face to face for interviews all their lives and aren't used to remote workforces. How have you re how are your recruiting efforts changed since implementing a remote work environment? Bill, what's Gordon Food done? Well, we we have certainly changed our thought as to uh, where we recruit. Um, we of course wanted a local employee, somebody invested in the local community, though that had been kind of been chipped away over the last five years anyway, as, as you're looking for specific talent. Uh, but now uh, kind of the hesitancy to recruit anywhere is gone. We realize employees can be productive wherever they may be. We can create team identity, but that's a separate topic. Uh, it, it's just, it's opened up that option more than it has before. So we still look locally, but we also post externally. We do have to be aware though of um, things like tax laws. Uh, we, we can't recruit in California as an example, because we don't do business in California and you don't want to get mired down into California tax law and everything like that. Sarah would know about that because farmers is very much there, uh, but we are not. And there's some really interesting rules around tax laws that you better pay attention to in your recruiting process. So you gotta, you, have, you do actually have to restrict where, where you are recruiting. Um, and kind of as a side note to recruitment, we find it to be a, a strong retention factor. The best way to not to recruit is to not have to recruit, right? Because you've retained. And 100% uh, remote really was a very, very rare exception. We had a lot of work from home. So there's the distinction, right? Oh, I work three, four days from home every week versus the 100% re remote person who lives in Atlanta, but his, his or her team is in Grand Rapids. We did that on very rare exception basis prior to the pandemic. And now it's, that's more, we have to be more open to that, A, and we're less scared of that than we were before. And it is still by exception, but it, it's, it's a strong retention factor and as we get more experience with that, again, maybe we'll recruit more in the Atlanta area and start to actually build a little center of excellence down in the Atlanta area. That, that's another discussion we're having about, do we start creating little pods of people? Because that might help some team identity, some Gordon Food Service cultural identity, if they can locally come, come together rather than we have 100 people in 100 different places. So that's a debate we're currently having a, within our recruiting process right now. Thanks, Bill. Now you go from the remote or recruiting process, interviewing process, screening process, you hire them, now you gotta onboard them. How has your uh, onboarding changed and adapted to uh, hiring remote workers? Sarah? Yeah, so we have been, I would say hiring remote workers for some time, but it looks different. So Farmers is headquartered in California, like Bill mentioned. We have a very large campus here in Grand Rapids and we have a large campus in Austin, Texas. And so many times we're hiring in one of those three locations. So maybe as a manager, you're, you're recruiting remotely. 
Um, but that person is going to walk into an office and have a little pod of friends already, you know? And so it was easier to, to establish that buddy system like Joel was talking about earlier. And we would do that intentionally, like here's a local buddy that's gonna take you to lunch and gonna show you where the printer is and like all, all of those things. Um, and so we had to go the path that Joel was talking about and establish the, the online buddy system. Um, we had to get really formal about what onboarding looked like. We were pretty informal about it before. It's just like, hey, we'll bring you along to this meeting and we'll bring you along to this meeting. That's very easy to remember when you walk past the desk of the new guy and you're like, oh yeah, just come along. It's very difficult to remember if you have to actually invite them to a meeting. And so we got really intentional about like, these are the meetings we expect every new hire to join. And these are the team meetings we expect them to join. And, and you know, and then their online buddy will bring them to their group meetings and things like that. So really it came down to just being formal about it, just documenting everything, understanding what that process, onboarding process should look like, uh, making sure that they have multiple, you know, call outs. So I, you know, I, I don't hire most of the people, my team does most of that, but I meet with every new person we hire right away and I'll meet with them again a month later just to see how things are going. Uh, because I think that's important that they feel, you know, a part of the of the bigger team outside of their little team, because we see these, um, we're seeing kind of little pillars being built within the team as they as they grow and mature and their online capabilities independently. Um, but how do I keep that kind of overarching culture? And so we're trying to do as much of this cross collaboration and you know step level one on ones and all these little fun things that, that Bill has mentioned before, just to keep, you know, keep those those new folks a part a part of the team because I know for them it's hard too. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sarah. That brings up a good point. You know, what uh, effective strategies are are we doing to make remote workers feel confident and comfortable in joining the team? Joel, you guys have been doing it for a while. What do you do there? Yeah, there, there's. I think it starts in the recruiting process. Um, first of all, we we usually refer to our team as a distributed team because remote has that connotation of alone, and so calling it a distributed team helps from there. And then in that interview process, we talk about like this is a day in the life of what you're going to be doing, so you fully understand exactly what you're getting into. Um, and so once they're on board, then regular one on ones with your manager to make sure that you're you're having those touch points and it's not about the manager distilling information to the to the employee it's the employee's chance to to talk to the manager like get advice i've been doing i've been working home for 13 years i probably have some advice that i can give someone who's been doing it for a month that they would appreciate um, we have a cameras on policy for all of our meetings to make sure so you can see facial expressions and body language and things like that and then understanding when to use different forms of communication it's real easy when you're working from home to to go, I'm just gonna spin my wheels, I don't wanna bother anybody. Whereas in an office, you just peek your head over the cube and say, hey, can you give me a hand here? And understanding like, when should I use email? When do I wanna slack or you know, hit, hit them up on Teams? And when should I call them or have a face-to-face -face meeting? Like those types of things. Um, that really helps, I think, get people up, um, up to speed and feel comfortable with joining the team. And then the last thing is, we try to plug people into a project or their team right away. We don't want to spend a week or two weeks going, here's all the onboarding stuff you need to do. Let's spread, if that spreads out to a month and a half and you can join your team and get to know and start working with your team right away, that's how you really get someone plugged in, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious, I, we didn't really talk about this before, but what, when does everybody think they'll be going back to the office or doing some sort of blended schedule? Is that going to happen anytime soon? Well, for right us, now, I can tell you it's never. <laughs> <laughs> right now, we're talking summertime there. How's that for a distinct uh, That's time? That's very concrete. I like that. But even then, that would be on a very voluntary basis rather than a uh, mandatory basis until who only knows who's going to make that final proclamation that, you know, the pandemic is done right and and to jane's point hey and now we can go back to normal well that that ain't happening so yeah, who's uh, normal right right so <laughs> uh, i'm i'm on the on the core committee about that but boy it just keeps moving further out and further out and nobody seems too distraught about that or few people do yeah, we're in the same boat. In fact, we've made some pretty 
um, pretty big real estate changes over the past year because we found that it was not necessary to hold all that real estate. And so now our return to normal cannot, it's not even possible that it looks like it used to. And so we're just in having the conversations of, okay, like what, let's be strategic about this and what does it look like? It's maybe, it's, you know, I think Joel talked about this. It's maybe a team gets together for a week and, and that could be like, they all fly in from their different locations and they spend a week in person and then off they back go. And, you know, then they'll get maybe next year or maybe it's twice a year. Um, and so we just have little spaces that folks can gather from, from around the country um, because yeah, our, our normal, our buildings are all still closed and, and except for our essential workers and, you know, no talk about when they'll just open back up again. That's a great point with the real estate piece. I'm very curious to what's going to happen in the, in the market for that in the near future. Um, it's amazing how many people are saying, well, we don't always have to be back in, uh, on site again. And the number of people that said before, we're out of space. We need to keep adding buildings. We don't have room for everybody. And now all of a sudden it's like, well, do we need room for everybody? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's helping the real estate market. That's for sure. <laughs> Although Grand Rapids still seems to be pretty good in that. It does. Um, can we go uh, around the room here and just kind of give... Uh, one final thought and um, piece of advice, a key takeaway about uh, the remote workforce and what you've seen. Jane, you want to start? Sure. I, you know, one one of the things I talk to my team about and also my business partners is let's please hold on to the things that we learned um, because th there's a lot of good things that happened in the last year plus. We've one proven that we can do things in some pretty interesting situations. And the other thing that we've proven in IS at Spectrum Health is that when we work together closely with our business partners with a shared goal, we can do things very, very quickly. And the key is focus. So, um, that that's I think the one thing I am optimistic about is that this gets in our muscle memory well enough that we don't forget what good happened. Joel? Yeah, I think the key takeaway I have of, of when, you, when you're managing a remote team is trust. You have to be able to trust your team. Um, you They've gone through the interview process, they made it through, Everybody's a professional. We're going to be treated like professionals uh, until you, and unless you prove otherwise. And, and a lot of that has to do with setting expectations. So make sure you're clear about what you expect and that you're meeting those expectations. And I think that that goes both ways for managers and employees. Sure, Sarah. I think for me, it's just taking an employee first approach, right? When we first went into this, it was understanding what's everybody's situation at home and how how can I make your life easier, right? That was my main goal in the beginning. What can I do to make this even remotely manageable? Um, and so we, you know, the, I think that leading with that method and, you know, if I can continue to do that through the rest of my career, I think I'll be a successful leader. Thanks, Sarah. Bill? Well, first of all, key takeaway is I miss my whiteboards and my dry erase markers. Uh, I, I honestly can't have a meeting without or didn't think I could. So one day there'll be a good technology that replaces that. Oh, we didn't but, even touch on technologies, but that's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, for some reason, Google hasn't figured that one out yet for me. Uh, I, I think yeah, the key works. takeaway here is, is we're still, we're still a team. You know, we've all got blown out on the wind out to wherever we are now, but team is still very important. Uh, and so managers have to be more thoughtful about it, even than before. Uh, hold those team um, happy hours. It's all virtual, but still do that. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier, and it is one of our strategies, we're gonna, we'll be flying people into Grand Rapids a couple times a year, minimally, for strategy meetings, for happy hours, for dinners out with vendors, with a chance to, again, do both work and socialize together, because those are very, very difficult to replace over video. Uh, we're trying, but we got to get people together periodically. And then the last takeaway really related to that is, 
we, we've had teams that have been established, you know, people have been together for 10, 15, 20 years. Again, don't rest on your laurels on that. You gotta, you gotta still be very conscientious about team building, even if you're, you've been together for a very, very long time. Just keep thinking about it um, and keep trying, keep trying different things and share, share with your peers about what's working for you. Because um, the moment you think you got all the good ideas, you're really, really wrong at that point. Thanks, Bill. And thanks everyone for uh, all the uh, great responses and great thought going into this. I'm gonna bring Ann back on now to see if we have any additional questions that have been asked. Yes, thank you, Robin. And thank you to all the panelists. I mean, they brought up some really great points and some things to consider, you know, as our attendees look to their own teams and projects and, um, you know, and what are some best practices moving forward. So we did have a few um, questions come through. Uh, one is a, is a fun comment. So our own Amy Lebednik from West Michigan Works, she did mention, uh, she misses the office supplies, especially sticky notes. At West Michigan Works, we use sticky notes to keep, you know, ideas in line, keeping to-do lists in order. And yes, yes. So I think I can I can speak for most of West Michigan Works when I say we definitely miss our office supply uh, office supplies there. Um, so I guess one question that came through. And I know we kind of touched upon um, some of the resources like at Spectrum Health with the care.com um, and the EAP systems that you have in place, but um, what are some other ideas that are working well for your staff um, that may be struggling with remote work, um, with the remote work environment? You know, maybe it's not childcare, maybe it's just being on the computer all day. Um, you know, what are some ideas that are working well for you and your teams? I can take that. And so one thing we did at Farmers is we offered the app Headspace to the entire organization. So we covered that cost, which is, a, you know, just a space you can go to talk to specialists or read articles or do all of the things related to mental health. Um, and, you know, at first, I think there was like, oh, maybe a couple of people would join, like the whole organization joined the, this, this Headspace. Um, and it's been so great, like just another tool to help with, you know, kind of all of the things that you were just just mentioning, and whether it's stress or overwhelmed or alone or you have too many people in your house or all all of the things. So that was a really really cool thing I thought farmers did for their organization. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, the stresses of just living in a pandemic, right? It it permeates all aspects of your life, whether it's personal or you know the work environment. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, are, were there any other challenges that that didn't come up during the panel discussion? Um, you know, either for you as a as a leader or your remote workers, and um, you know, and then how did you maybe address some of those challenges? We, I can take we do have some people that live um, in a in spaces that there just isn't really good Wi-Fi, and so we have made provisions for those people to work in the office if they need to. Um, and there's other circumstances that, that present themselves that really deem a person to need to work in the office. Now they have to follow all the, all the rules and regulations of what that means to work in the office, masks and all, all those things. So um, that is one thing that we've, that we've done that's I think helped because it's not a one size fits all solution always. Yeah, thank you. We certainly you. gave people an opportunity to come into the office and grab their two or three extra monitors and their special mouse and their and and set up a, a workspace that is just like the workspace that they had at the office. Now this might cause a problem when we go back to maybe a split concept. <laughs> might have to have those setups in two places going forward, but uh, no no hesitancy to let people take whatever technology they needed to do that. And then uh, to keep um, emphasizing that EAP, we had that prior to the pandemic, but we really advertised that as a, as a good outlet for people to use. Uh, we have seen increased usage of it, so we, Thankful, we're thankful we had it. We also had a group called Care Partners. These are people who handle maybe more of a spiritual and um, mental, um, I don't know, well-being kind of concept versus 
physical or physician style. Mm -hmm. and, and those care partners have been there for more just to talk to somebody. And it doesn't even need to be a medical professional in that situation, a therapist, none of that, just a good listener, a, a good person to just sit and talk things through with you. So that, that's been a, a helpful program we had in place beforehand, but continue to, to work with. Great, thanks, Bill. Um, we did have another question come through. Um, they say, great discussion. And then they would like to hear a bit more about onboarding. You know, how did you put together a formal onboarding? Um, did you hire an outside consultant or put together a team to sort of document that process? So I guess I'll start with that because that's kind of a little bit of what I was talking about. Um, I didn't outsource it. Um, I, I actually took like my four most recent hires and sat them down and said like, what worked and what didn't work? Like, let's talk through this. What did you need? Um, that you didn't get like how, how did this play out um, and so we just like line by line went through like every, like their first month on the job you know we were looking at their calendars and we were like look, comparing it to my calendar and what were they where were they not that they should have been and meetings were they not invited to and so it really like I used the folks that we had just recently hired to kind of help help me build that out and we had a Kind of straw man like buddy system onboarding thing for when we were in the office and we just kind of flew that up into something that worked remotely so if you i would say if you have if you're starting from scratch then absolutely get get some outside help uh, but if you have a little bit of what things look like internally you can kind of work with those folks that have gone through it because um, those are the experts right the folks that you've hired in the past 12 months are going to absolutely know where you hit the mark or where you fell short and so those folks for me were really, um, you know, really beneficial in building that out formally. Yeah, that's great advice, Sarah. Thank you. Um, for the non-technical folks in in the audience, um, can someone uh, explain safe and what and what that is and what that kind of looks like uh, for the non-technical folks in the room? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, I can take a, a, a run at it, and Jane, I'm sure you can jump in here too on this. Um, SAFE stands for Scaled Agile Framework, and boy, that's helpful, I'm sure, to you in understanding what that means. Uh, it, it's, um, it's, a, it's a way to plan out your work, and so every quarter, um, the teams gather. The, the, basically the whole team, both IT and then their business partners, and they go through the work list and they, um, they prioritize, they argue, they try to decide how many resources they're going to need to commit to those things, how many resources are available, all of that work. And over a two-day period, they, they hammer stuff out and really to say for the next three months, this is the work that we're going to do. And uh, every three months is good, rather than pretend that we can plan a year out in advance. Now, every three months, we can plan it out. But even that's not enough. So we certainly have the two-day event. And that's wonderful. Gets things set up, gets everybody on the same page. But, you know, it takes about a week to two weeks before something, a wrench gets thrown in. And then you have... Um, synchronization meetings throughout the course of the three months where you go oops this isn't going to plan or here's a priority that came in after the fact that now needs to be fit in and you kind of rearrange the parts a little bit but you're more tweaking it rather than going through the entire thing again and it's just a nice again agile is really the 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 word there this helps us stay agile with the work that's coming in the work that's happening and responding to the realities as it happens and then talking about what's coming down the pipe, even three, six, nine months out, because you still talk about those things. Yeah, when I when I talk about this with um, non-IS folks, I always uh, use the analogy that um, we're not gonna we're not creating a project team around a project. We're creating a project team around the business value that we're trying to drive and we bring the work to the team instead of the team to the work. So there's a lot more efficiencies built in. And the other thing is we we slice the work up into small uh, incremental value. 
So we don't have to deliver, you know, a fully baked um, ERP solution or or something like that. We just we just need to make it a little bit better. So this idea that we continuously improve uh, processes through the use of IT and we're much more aligned, not around products, like we've been like IT products, but the business product that we're delivering, for example, population health or, or physician practice. Yeah, thank you, Bill and Jane, appreciate that. <clears throat> All right, I guess um, one final question, if we're hopping back to, you know, projects that come across, you know, the projects your teams are working on, um, can you share some ideas or um, latest tips or tricks on, yeah, remote projects, keeping them moving forward? We, I mean, that, that's pretty, projects are pretty much all we do as a consulting company. So uh, we have a fairly, um, I guess agile process where it's it's regular regular cadence of daily stand-ups we I said we wanted to get into it like a written uh, written <clears throat> company and we don't do our daily stand-ups as stand-ups one time a day you're gonna post something in a slack channel of here's what I did yesterday here's what I did today and here's my blockers same thing that you do in a normal stand-up just it's distributed so it's asynchronous um, we have weekly check-ins to say where are we on 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 track we have by we, we do two-week sprints, so we're going to have a sprint planning meeting and then a sprint demo, and we're so the team is constantly working together. We've got an engagement leader, project manager who's checking in to make sure, hey, are we going to meet all the things? We have mid-sprint check-ins, and just having that regular cadence really keeps everybody accountable and and on track, and make sure you don't get like you're, you're going to post every day saying this is what I did. If you post four days in a row that you're doing the same thing, someone's probably going to start going, hey, is there something I can help you with? And and you and you're going to get to the point where you're like, well, I'm not going to have them ask me. I'm going to reach out and and make sure that I'm not stuck. Awesome, thank you, Joel. Well, I mean, I'll give the attendees if there are any final questions you have for the panelists, you know, pop them in the questions section before we wrap up here. Um, but thank you all so much for bringing your expertise bringing your insights, sharing, you know, your anecdotal experiences. We greatly appreciate it. And, you know, on behalf of West Michigan Tech Talent and West Michigan Works, we are so thrilled that you were able to join us this evening. And I hope you all have a wonderful night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, everyone. Thank Take care, everyone. Thanks.